So I'd like you to welcome the first of my three panelists, Rihan Baik, who is the Chief Corporate Affairs Strategy and Sustainability at Aquapower. Rihan, welcome. Thank you. Lots of uh, titles in there. Lots, lots of titles. Then we have Jeremy Crane, who is the CEO of Yellow Door Energy. Jeremy, welcome. Finally, we have Nicola Seppi, who is Managing Director of Global Energy Innovation at the Bezos Earth Fund. Please welcome my panelists for a discussion that we're about to start. Um, Jeremy, I just want to bring in the, what you said earlier about carrying this discussion in Arabic. It's not going to be in Arabic. It's going to be in English. <laughs> everyone is, um, you know, everyone is going to understand this. So. The first question, and I know that I'm asking a lot about challenges, but really, I mean, it's it's what we're facing right now. It's what everyone is asking in this COP. These challenges have existed for a while, and they're persistent, and we need to address them. So I think my first question for, for the three of you, starting with you, Rihan, is going to be, first of all, how do you think you can collaborate with governments to unlock clean energy? What are the challenges that you're facing in that, how can those, how can we find solutions to those? Um, okay, so first of all, thank you for having me. I think uh, this was prefaced really well by uh, both uh, Raed and Dr. Nasser because they gave you a kind of context of the world in which Aquapower is playing right now, right? So we're executing, we're actually doing uh, a lot of these projects. We're um, uh, investing heavily in renewables. We're the world's largest uh, private desalination company. We're a first mover in green hydrogens, and uh, we are working with the finance community, working very, very strongly with uh, transition. So, uh, and our relationship with governments is very, very strong. So, the first thing is obviously we're very proud to be part of Vision 2030. We're a Saudi national champion, uh, and we are essentially an extension of the Saudi decarbonization uh, agenda. So, if you look at Aqua Power 10 years ago, we had next to no renewables in our portfolio, and today it's close to almost 40 percent in terms of our renewable portfolio so in 10 years we've added a significant amount and a large part of this is because of the uh, government agenda to decarbonize so we've moved very swiftly uh, to kind of execute these and renewables really is not an ideological decision any longer it's really commercial you know I think I talked about this it is the smartest commercial decision it can de be deployed very rapidly even through the throes of uh, what we've seen in, uh, in uh, COVID, et cetera, we've been able to execute projects and they're coming online. Um, and the same thing with uh, when it comes down to desalination or uh, utilities. So I had the privilege of being at the Red Sea uh, two weeks ago. So I've seen firsthand what we can do and what we've executed, a very, very complicated but uh, uh, amazing project, again, with yeah. support from, uh, from PIF uh, you know, uh, and, and the Red Sea. And the same thing with the New York Green Hydrogen Company which is a uh, you know, $8.5 billion investment alongside uh, for Aquapower, Air Products, our partners, and Neom. Uh, again, so we're doing these kind of things. So uh, it comes because you've got one leadership, the right framework, which governments uh, have to bring, uh, and the right financing. Right. Uh, it's a, the magic sort of mix around it. That's yeah. what we bring. Yeah. Jeremy, I mean, Yellow Door is accelerating very fast. What, what are you doing? How are you carrying these conversations with other private players and governments, what would you say are the biggest challenges and the solutions to them in your experience? Well, thank you very much. And it's, uh, it's a, it's a, it is a huge okay. challenge. Um, and I think the context of, of the discussion today and the, the introduction was great because you hear about what the challenge is. And then I think what you're seeing up here now is people who are doing things. Yeah. Um, Yellow Door has uh, 33 projects under construction today. Actions on the ground happening, helping business businesses realize that clean agenda. And when it comes to the government context and how we work with with policymakers, um, what uh, <clears throat> our approach to to the challenge is to say, hey, look, there is a alternative to um, the conventional way of getting energy, you can produce most of the energy needs for your business on site, on your rooftop, in your backyard, in your car park, to enable a business to make that transition. Whether 
the policies are there or not. Um, so for our business, what we're trying to do is, is help those businesses. We, we, we invest in the infrastructure to allow those businesses to transition to a clean energy source, to a perhaps in, in many of the markets we're operating a more reliable energy source, a more resilient energy source. Um, and then finally, and, and perhaps most importantly, a less expensive energy source. You know, our, our businesses, that our partners, are saving 30 to 50 percent on their cost of energy by transitioning to a clean energy yeah. source. I mean, who wouldn't want to do that, especially, you know, with a yellow door who's also making the investment for those businesses, so, and as, as many others are in the market. So I think it's a, <clears throat> for us, when we look at the government barriers that we face in many places, we say, well, look, let's, let's, Let's change the dialogue. Let's let the business do what the businesses do best and make a decision that's best for them. Um, I will just add one point. We're very excited about new news in Dubai. I think there, there's some plans to um, enable greater access, mm. allow businesses to take more of those decisions. And uh, that's just coming out right now. So we're, we're excited about that evolution. That's great. Nicole, welcome to Dubai. Thank and, you. I mean, in your position at the Bezos Earth Fund, philanthropy plays a big part. How, how do you think philanthropy can be used to unlock clean energy? Certainly. So the Bezos Earth Fund is actually a new philanthropy, and we're actually the only philanthropy in existence today globally that's focused solely on climate and nature, and we're the largest commitment. So our initial endowment is $10 billion dollars, in grant funds, that means no return for any dollar, but be catalytic in accelerating the energy transition. The other mm -hmm. thing we do that's quite distinct for the Bezos Earth Fund is, is that we're not just about accelerating the energy transition, we view it from a system change, meaning that we're not just looking at the needs today, but we're looking at the ultimate energy system. What is that ultimate society that we all want to be part of? And what, what do we do now in this decisive decade to really accelerate it? And philanthropy, like anyone, we've got multiple parties. It's not just on one side. So it's philanthropy, it's private sector, it's government, it's entrepreneurs, innovators. But the uniqueness of philanthropy is that we're independent. We don't represent any specific government or any specific organisation. We are there focused on impact and to be catalytic and to take some bold chances, meaning big bets and really trying to accelerate it. Now, with that, that takes big risks and we're open to big risks. Now, sometimes we've got to learn some lessons, but the main thing is we learn from them and we keep going forward. The other thing with philanthropy is we're very quick. We can make investments, we can do decisions that is catalytic where we need it. But the role of philanthropy really is that we've got to recognise that the global energy industry is a live economic ecosystem. And so everyone has a role. So philanthropy definitely is part of the solution, but it's not the only solution. So philanthropy is there to really hone in on what are the gaps and barriers today and where could we use our special capital, because it's 100% grant based, to really accelerate with our fellow stakeholders and partners to really execute more at a quicker speed. That's great. And Jeremy, I want to bring it back to you. But before that, I know that my colleague Sarah prepared a few charts for us. Um, if we can see a couple of the charts that um, have been viewed uh, about solar power um, in, the, in the Gulf um, in the Gulf countries, um, Jeremy, when I, you know, when we look at economies in this part of the world, the Gulf mainly, I cover economics, and I can, you know, I can say that these countries are still very much heavily reliant on oil prices to sustain their, you know, fiscal balances. That's still reality. They're definitely working to change that. But where you, you know, where you're based right now, how do you think? clean energy uh, can improve energy resilience in this part of the world? Uh, that's a great question. Um, look, I think uh, absolutely, I mean, <clears throat> the, the nations of this region are built on um, making revenues from, from oil and gas. There's no question about it. Um, I think the, the, the easiest way to 
express how solar fits into that is oil and gas is our great resources for <clears throat> for many many things in our lives but most predominantly transportation if we can burn less uh, fossil fuels in electricity generation mm. by shifting to clean electricity be it large plants like like aqua's doing or or site specific plants <clears throat> the economies here will be able to um, consume less on their own domestic needs and i think that's that's where we see a a really win-win for the for the government the policy makers of the region right brehan how how can how can these governments sort of leverage clean power um, to improve resilience? Yeah, I think, you know, I'm, I, I touched on this. I think this is part of what we're seeing in Saudi Arabia, in the UAE. I mean, uh, just uh, you can see the, there's a five gigawatt uh, plant here in the UAE mm. that's going to be, uh, in fact, one of them which we are partnering in will be inaugurated uh, today. But the, uh, like I said, it's, it's not ideological. It's, it's commercially good. It's cheap. I mean, we hold the records on uh, energy tariffs now uh, that we've set as Guinness World Records that, that sit there. Now, some of them are unlikely in the current uh, interest rate climate to be repeated, but still, they're highly, highly, they're cheap, they're effective, and they can be deployed very rapidly. And, and you can look at our portfolio and see how we're doing that, both in, uh, in Saudi and in the UAE, for example. So it can be done, and, and it's just a question of, like I said, how it comes together. How do you put the, uh, the right framework, the, the IPP framework? The, uh, and the same thing for water, by the way. I should mention that you know, 50% of the energy cost of water, and uh, Dr. Nasser talked about the importance of, uh, uh, you know, uh, desalination. We now have, we, we have just submitted bids and, and, and won and, and, and building projects close to or, uh, under 40 cents a cubic meter. That's 40 cents for 1,000 liters, roughly. So it just shows you when you can drive the cost down, you can, you can make a big difference, and it's the commercially right thing to do, and you can drive it rapidly. You just need the right financing environment. You need the right uh, government backing and the right frameworks. And you need, the, uh, you need our skills to be able to put this together and deploy it very rapidly. So it's doable. Right. And, you know, I, I hear this a lot, financing. Um, it's, it's very important. It's something that you all have touched on, including Dr. Nasir. Nicole, to bring it back to you, what do you think are, you know, what, what do you think is the role of international partnerships to mobilize financing? And then... What do you think could be done better in order to bring in this much needed financing? Oh, look, to execute the energy transition, it's a partnership, it's a collaboration. But it's also not just the collaborations we see today. We need to raise some other voices that we're not seeing around that table to move it to where we need to. The other thing I would say is it's not an issue of shortage of funding. There are trillions out there. One of the crucial issues right now that for the speed and scale that we're not executing this energy transition at present is that we're not linking the right capital to the right type of deals or the execution. So we've got to look at what is stopping that nexus, the speed and scale. We've also got to look at that risk assessment. We've got to really change all our mindsets, not just the bankers and not just the governments and the deal makers and the investors, but even like the financial modelers and that. We've got to rethink the economics to make this energy transition really executional. The other thing is, and I would borrow the words of Dr. Sultan, COP28 president, is that we need leaps. We don't need small steps. So what we need is leaders, whether it be government, private sector or other parts of the industry, really stepping up and seeing what is needing and maybe being the first movers. Because as we know in the industry, once you're the first movers and you show the business case, the others follow. So we need a little bit more of increased leadership across everyone, not just one part of the sector. It's everyone in the ecosystem. And it's really going to be the, the ones that are going to step up. Who are they going to be part of that execution of that energy transition? The other thing I think too is, and it was mentioned in the initial discussion, is that as much as it's important to change it to a green fuel and accelerate the global renewables, we must also look at the wider framework, the grid. We, at the Bezos Earth Fund, we're about executing the energy transition. But if you're going to achieve that ultimate energy system that we're all aspiring for, you can't ignore the whole frame, which is the actual grid. And right now, there's a wonderful opportunity 
on the grid as well as development of renewables is that basically anywhere in the world we can correlate, we can share that REX and really accelerate it because we're moving into more of a digital economy and that digital energy transition can be accelerated through increased partnership and collaboration. That's great. Jeremy, funding mechanisms, financing, and I'm focusing a lot on that question because it, it is really what people want to hear about at this COP28. It's what people want to understand how to, again, unlock. <clears throat> so funding mechanisms that work, that don't work, what has worked for you versus what hasn't, and what do you think needs to be worked on? Um, yeah, great. So I think what's unique about Yellow Door is we're doing small projects mm. and doing funding transactions on a small project on a case by case basic is absolutely inefficient. So what is critical for us is that we're packaging together um, a lot of small projects into a portfolio where investors and lenders can can look at it on a holistic basis, evaluate the risk and, and make a, a wise investment. That's the, that's the target. And what are the barriers, as, as you asked? Um, I think one of them, one of the biggest barriers for, for our business is long-term planning. Mm. When there isn't consistency in regulation, when there isn't a view that we know what's going to happen in five years or in 15 years, businesses have a hard time making a decision. So if I'm sitting with a CEO of a cement company and he knows he can save 30% by by choosing Yellow Door, he still might not go forward because he's committing to that long term. And what if there's a policy change that affects his core business? So <clears throat> our, I think one of the, the elements that all financiers face is how do, you make, how do we make sure that we're going to be making these investments along with those businesses for, for that long duration, which capital intensive clean energy projects require. Again, it comes back to the policy, right? Consistent policies drive long-term planning, drive lower costs, drive the capital. And I just want to, you know, I want to ask another question on, on the back of that. When you talk about policy making, that's something that certainly comes up a lot in this region, the fact that policies can, in fact, change overnight. Is that something that you think is more of an issue in this part of the world? And you know, how would you? What would your advice be to sort of address that? Look, I think this this region is certainly very dynamic, right? It's been growing so rapidly. We saw this slide a few minutes ago showing the pace of of energy growth, right. which is a reflection of the growth in the region. And when things are growing, things are changing, and that's this is a um, a, a very accelerating place, but any emerging market faces those same, those same fundamentals. Mm. Um, so I think you know, there's two ways that we look at it. How can we think about renewable assets being uh, funded and, and capital being returned on a more rapid basis? Perhaps it's a, you know, as, we were, as you just mentioned, has, is it, perhaps it's a way of changing the way that we look at structuring the financing. Can it be a five-year Term versus right. a, a twenty-year term, um, can we uh, pull in some other some other support to take the risk that's beyond the the bankable period, beyond the five or the ten-year period? Right. Can we get an offtake agreement, or a redundant or a backup offtake with the utility? Mm -hmm. So, looking at those at those structures is what what we're trying to do to, to bridge the uncertainty. Right. And then final question for you know the three of you, starting with you, Rahan, technological advancements. I know a lot of people are interested in that discussion um, in this COP and when talking about energy transition. But what do you think are the you know, uh, ways uh, that technological advancements have aided in uh, unlocking a clean energy in a way that is sustainable but also cost effective because I know we've spoken about solar power and how you know over the past two decades they're much more cost effective now so how you know what are their examples do you have for us so I'm, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to talk on uh, technology but I, I really want to talk about finance because it's so important right and, and uh, you know when we do our projects we're talking about 25 30 year deals so you you really getting the multilateral developments and I love uh, Dr. Nasser's suggestion by the way it was a uh, you know, we need to bring a lot more capital to the party for sure. And uh, 
we need to get a lot more private sector finance involved. So to give you an example, one of the things that we're doing is we're getting directly with pension funds to get involved in our project. So on a typical deal, Aqua Power has a 80, 20, 75, 25 debt to equity ratio uh, for our project. So for every essentially dollar that we deploy, you deploy another $10 of capital around it, right? So you're really getting that to work. So to accelerate that uh, is, is entirely doable. So you've got to get, you know, uh, cap, pr private capital into it. On technology, so uh, to give you a very good example on, uh, on, uh, on water desalination. So historically, all, uh, a lot of the desal plants, what we call multi-stage uh, flash distillation uh, you know, uh, plants, highly, highly energy intensive. And today, Aqua Power led the industry into uh, seawater reverse osmosis, which is very low in uh, energy consumption. We continue to do a lot of stuff around software technology on uh, driving the cost down. Uh, and then we're very active in the startup universe and working with the universities, for example. So we have an R&D uh, an innovation center that works mm. with the likes of the KAUST and CAXT and a, a number of different institutes in Saudi Arabia and in the uh, open ecosystem. So uh, we're, we're looking at all avenues where we can be making uh, significant improvements. The other area is in green hydrogen also, uh, which is, you know, uh, relatively new, but the work that we're trying to do with the uh, electrolyzer manufacturers to get costs down is another area that we're trying to uh, do some work in. Jeremy? Look, I see, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm very practical uh, in how we look at technology and in that we really look for taking what's the best options on the market and implementing them. When we started in 2015, um, the most efficient solar panels we could put in and the cost of those panels was saving a customer 5%. One of our first customers, Unilever, forward thinker in this space, they were happy with that. But the, the pace of evolution means that if I was installing that same system, that same customer today, I'd be saving them 50% and I'd be generating almost 50% more power from the same uh, area. That, coupled with what we're now seeing as very rapid decline in cost of storage, mm. means that the amount of energy that a building, uh, a factory, a, a commercial center can use for renewables is just shooting up. We're at that point where we've got customers who are choosing to disconnect from the grid because we can produce all the power they need. We can have batteries to store it and have a little bit of, of dirty backup, of course for the long, long rainy periods, but uh, we don't have those, too many of those here. Um, so so that, that technology evolution is, is incremental, yeah. incrementally better year over year, and it means that we're, we're crossing, eight years ago we crossed a tipping point for it to be cheaper on site for a little bit of solar. Today we're crossing a tipping point for it to be fully renewables on site. Nicole, ending this with you. Yeah, no, certainly. So philanthropy does have a role to look into technology. We have a unique role in the sense that because we can take very high risks, we can take big bets. And so what we are looking, particularly with the Bezos Earth Fund, our system change focus is, is that what's the technology that we need to accelerate this energy transition that either isn't getting the funding or not the focus? And let us try and accelerate that uh, research as well as that investment into the technology. So what you'll find is that we're looking at those gaps where there's already funding to certain technology. From my perspective, it does not make sense for philanthropy to go in there. But where philanthropy is very valuable is where funding's not going or sufficient funding and it does actually show that there's a real scalable impact and I mean a real impact to accelerate that energy transition. So we are very much looking at technologies all around the world. I, the opportunity, but the challenge for us at the Bezos Earth Fund is that we can go anywhere in the world and anywhere along the value chain. So it's really just honing in as to how can we make our precious capital, because it's 100% grant based, really catalytic as a co-partner and a collaborator to execute this energy transition. Thank you so much for that. Thank you to my panelists for this wonderful discussion and for all of you for uh, tuning in. I'd also want to say thank you again to uh, our sponsor, Red Sea Global, for the opening remarks.